Welcome back. Uh, I am Dr. Kaylee Champion as of like two weeks ago. You know, in case you ever wonder, it is possible to get a degree in open source. Um, I am living proof of that. Uh, my talk today, research says, insights on building, leading, and sustaining open source. Oh, I need a mic. What if I talk really loud? Will it pick me up? She's like, she's like giving me a signal that like this is not good. All right. Here's some infos on uh, how to contact me. My slides will be up on my blog very shortly. So the plan for the talk today, yeah, there we go. So we're going to talk about what can research tell us about building, leading, and sustaining open source. We'll get oriented a little bit about the problems that uh, I'm here to talk about, talk about the challenges we face, some strategies to respond to them, and then do some takeaways. So besides me, the work that you'll see uh, is the efforts of a crowd, not only this crowd, but researchers all across the globe who study open source. This is my lab group. This is at one of our retreats. Not everybody here studies open source, although they should. Uh, we study online communities in various ways. All right, so the scope of kind of my concern and why I feel like these questions are important that I'm about to go through are the ways that free and open source software serve as digital infrastructure. It's everywhere. Uh, it's in all the tools that we use. And the world runs on open source software, including academic research. Uh, that includes the digital infrastructure that we all rely on day to day. That includes the tools and languages that we use. That includes uh, settings and data sources. So whether you know it or not, the open source communities you participate in are often the subjects of research. Uh, if you post a GitHub, if you use GitLab, anything that's publicly available, some researcher somewhere may very well be scraping your work. But putting this research that's done into practice can be a challenge. So I want to thank all of you for being here as part of bridging that gap between research and practice. What we're doing right now is building that bridge, and thank you for being part of it. All right, so that's kind of my basic orientation, where I'm coming from and where I, sort of where I am in the world. I want to talk about the challenges I feel like we face. Then we'll work on strategies and some takeaways. So these two resources that I've uh, placed here, these are sort of citations, and you'll see so many citations on these slides. Uh, these are great resources if you ever feel like you need to make the case to somebody that free software is hard, that it's a lot of work. Those stories are told very well, yes, by all of us, and we live that every day, uh, but they're also told in print, both in sort of ethnography or sort of almost novel-like form in this book that's written by Nadia Agbal, as well as many articles. So I want to um, encourage folks, even if what I say is obvious, um, to use the citations as ways of making that case back to your own communities, your companies, your, the places that you're working. Free software is a lot of work and scaling is hard. In fact, community might not even be our original goal, if it's our goal at all. You heard Matt talking about that a little bit earlier today. Uh, user support can be a huge strain and maybe not what we're in the business of doing. Events, however, like this one, I hope, uh, can build trust, improve teamwork, and make the whole experience a lot more fun. However, I think we want to always beware of catastrophic success and the way that being successful can drag us down and lead to failure and consider opportunities to automate, automate, and automate. So this is one angle of why I feel like we have challenges that we need to do research on and problems to solve. Another major piece of this challenge and one where I'm intimately concerned is that some critical infrastructure is neglected. So LeftPad and CrowdStrike are both examples, these kind of incidents. You can read about them on Wikipedia if they haven't been in your news feed. Um, I don't know how you avoided them, but you sure, if you managed to avoid the CrowdStrike story, it's well told on Wikipedia. I feel like both of these incidents kind of remind us how interdependent we are, um, how individual actions or very specific small actions can cascade and spread through kind of our whole infrastructure. I also think vulnerabilities like the Heartbleed vulnerability and more recently Log for Shell can indicate what I call misalignment. So this happens when something that's extremely important is nonetheless low quality. It's not maintained to the standard that it needs to be. And in fact, I did a study of Debian, which is very well maintained, very well respected, and yet in Debian, thousands of important packages are low quality, below what we would expect, given how important they are and how widely deployed they are. So even Debian has this problem. 
And I did a follow-up study looking at that data, and what I found is that that risk, that level of misalignment, actually increases with time. So this is something that all of our packages, all of our work, will have to face over time as we all get older and as our packages get older. All right, so those are kind of the challenge spaces that I've been thinking about a lot. Let's talk about strategies to respond. And I'm always looking for levers, you know, that small, in, in the classical, like, simple machine sense of a lever, that small motion that you can make that will actually make a big difference. Because there's a million things that you could use to respond to these issues, but what's the one that will actually move things, change the, change the situation, uh, sort of in the maybe the lowest effort possible given we have kind of a conservation of energy problem? I'm going to do takeaways in a bit. All right, so what does make a difference? How can we prevent and counter this misalignment that I talked about, this highly important uh, packages that are nonetheless low quality? And then how do we build sustainable communities to support this software? One of the sort of challenges in all of this is that a sustainable community can produce very popular but low quality software. Sometimes the metrics we look for when we're trying to measure if a community is sustainable go against uh, or do not predict very well at all whether a piece of software will be high quality. So that means that our goals can be in conflict and we can't assume that our, uh, that our very sustainable, lovely, wonderful community is producing great software. We actually have to manage both concerns. Great software might not outlast its maintainer and I feel that we need both strong communities and the alignment of quality, of importance with quality and security uh, to serve this digital infrastructure that we're all kind of engaged in. So how do we do that? I described these problems. Come on, let's have some solutions. There's two basic angles, I think. I do think it starts with awareness. We have to know we have a problem and be motivated to solve it. And then we need to intervene, take action, do things that make a difference. All right. So. I describe this sense of misalignment of maintenance effort, and we can think about that in two dimensions. We can think at ecosystem level, uh, we can think about an entire programming language, we can think about an entire operating system distribution, uh, we can think at a very broad level, uh, or we can think at a very sort of specific package, our project, our world, our community, where we are sort of very specifically in one spot, and think about the life cycle of that very specific project that we're engaged in. The methods that I've described and elaborated in my dissertation have four essential steps. We want to measure importance. We want to measure quality or security. We want to specify a relationship between those factors and then measure deviations between them. And I have several worked examples later in the presentation that will step you through exactly how to do that. All right, so here's my first example. This process, this four-step process in action uh, first up, you can measure importance. I did this in the context of the Debian project. Measure quality. Uh, in this case, I used the pylint output run against uh, packages written in Python. You can specify a relationship between importance and quality. And then you can look for gaps and slopes between those two quantities. So where do you have a highly important package that's written in Python that's uh, widely deployed, uh, but it is very low quality? And then we can think about slopes. So my idea about slopes here, oh, let me show you really quickly what the important stuff is before I get into slopes. So Debian runs this really great thing called Popularity Contest. This is an app that runs on individual machines, and it reports back not only when things are installed, but what's run on individual machines. And this is like gold data for um, doing research in free and open source software because very often we only know downloads, we don't know what's actually in use out there. My measure of quality I mentioned was Pylint. This is super easy to install. I talked about specifying a relationship. We talked about this mismatch of importance and quality. So you might think, okay, where are we, where are we at? Uh, we have these highly important things that I talked about, and oh, if it's relatively low quality, now we live in this land of risk. Another way we might think about a certain package, we're like, okay, our importance, pretty good. Quality, pretty good. We'll call those aligned. If importance is relatively low and quality is high, I'm gonna call that overproduction. There's maybe a potential for wasted effort if your package is really great quality and no one is using it. Uh, it's not a problem, but um, you could think about whether or not those, some of those resources might be deployed elsewhere. 
So this is a relationship that um, you can specify as you're doing an analysis like I described. What do you get when you run one of those analyses? So I put these data kind of on the same uh, basic axes that, of, that I showed you before for specifying this relationship. Quality here runs from low to high. Importance here runs from low to high. And now I can graph each one of those packages and where it sits. My measure of importance, I'm looking at things relative to their kind of best days versus their worst days. So when your package was highly important versus where it is today, what its, what its quality was over time. You can find that spot and then locate your package based on quality versus importance. Here I have two in blue, UFW and GNO Music. Those are the two that I'm most concerned about and let me tell you why. The slopes of the trajectories of those packages are going in a direction that I'm concerned about. So we could say, okay, fine. Packages are right now, the quality is mm, not that great, it's very important, but what's the trajectory? What's the trend? How are things going over time? If your quality is going down while your importance is still rising, I would say you're at risk. I would say more and more thing, people are deploying your software and the quality is falling off. That's a, an increasing risk. That's a problem that's not solving itself over time. People are not stepping up and taking charge. All right. So this kind of perspective on thinking about slopes, uh, you could sort of generalize something like this. You think about quality here in blue. Maybe it rises over time and then it falls. You can think about importance. Everybody gets excited, something gets deployed, uh, but eventually maybe it falls off. And how serious or how concerned we are about these metrics might be different depending on where we are in one of these rise and decline kind of curves. And when we look at these, when we look at these gaps, we can, say, we can sort of assess how serious that problem is. So if your importance is quite high but your quality is quite low, maybe this is a risk period. But here they're starting to converge. So maybe we're a little bit less concerned because the quality is starting to catch up. OK, great. Here we are. We're very happy here because finally we've kind of caught up. These things are together. Uh, but importance keeps climbing. Here we are. Quality, though, mm, flattening off. We get one last push, and then it falls. Here we have importance going down again. Maybe we're less concerned because the, sort of the, the system is self-correcting. People are no longer installing this thing. Um, so my perspective would be that your package is at risk when um, these pieces are sort of misaligned and your slopes are not going the direction that you would hope for. Let me show you what that looks like in the case of UFW and GNOME Music. Here's GNOME Music. Here we have its importance in red and its quality in blue. And what we see for GNOME Music is this importance curve kind of climbing, 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 and it's holding pretty steady. But quality, quality climbs and then it's falling off. This is an issue. This is a problem. Maybe we need to intervene and kind of course correct because there seems to be an issue here. Uh, UFW, uh, this is a sort of firewall management tool. Here we see pretty close tracking of importance and quality. So uh, importance is in red and quality in blue. Here they are climbing kind of together, although we have these long periods where it, everything's still climbing and quality has not moved. But then we see some irregularity here in quality toward the edge, while importance is just making this sort of inexorable climb upward. So here also, this doesn't look like a situation that's correcting itself. Uh, quality is struggling and importance continuing to climb. These two packages, based on this longitudinal perspective, I think um, are at risk and we should be concerned. So that's an example of how to use this method to measure sort of deviations or, or areas of risk. All right. So those are some strategies. There are some places where I think intervening is particularly challenging, despite the fact that there's a lot of uh, sort of energy and research and discussion about them. So those challenging areas are newcomers, funding, governance, and organizing our work. Lots of people want to tell you what to do about all of these things. So I sort of feel bad joining that crowd. But what I want to say is that the news is a little bit more uh, complicated than what we might be led to believe. So newcomers, very challenging. Necessary for projects to be sustained. They can be recruited with social media and directed if you tag those issues. However, new numbers of newcomers are not enough. Experienced folks are the ones that make the big difference in sustainability, not the newcomers. 
That's what this research is showing. So the question then, of course, is how do you get experienced folks in your project? They probably come from the newcomers. But if you feel that you just have to throw the doors open to bring in as many newcomers as possible, that's a very long-term play. Uh, experienced folks are the, are the sort of difference making in sustainability on a project. Another challenging area to think about how to intervene is with respect to funding. So there's lots of discussion about this. I will point out that what the research record is showing right now is that these large umbrella organizations, the sort of big names in our world, are showing flat or declining activity levels. So they may not be the model of the future or we'll need to revitalize them if that's how we want things to go. Another area of research here has shown that sponsorship may have little to no impact if you use GitHub sponsors. Uh, perhaps modest, kind of short-term, individual impact, although tweeting it out may help. Also finding around funding is that paid contributors contribute differently than volunteers. We see this again and again in the data. Maybe that's good for your community, maybe it's not, but it's complicated. You need to think through sort of what that mix looks like and what it means for your project and your community. Finally, what folks observe is that figuring out how to spend funds may be even more challenging than raising them, but kind of event travel type support is a pretty common solution there. Um, so it's just something to think about. Just getting dollars is sort of not enough. Third area of challenge is around governance. This is where also the research record is a little bit complicated. So the question here is, do we follow our own rules when it comes to granting power? Not always. Uh, being formal, though, in how we govern these communities can increase our risk. Uh, the use of formal pro processes may not be significant in terms of maintaining alignment in our communities. However, one bright spot, sharing power is associated with lower underproduction. So this is that case where things, despite being very important, are relatively low quality. One thing that can counter that is this notion of shared power. Another finding from research on this subject is that more policies on a topic doesn't necessarily mean more effort. So if you're worried about a subject, writing an even longer document about that topic may not be the way to get things to move on that subject. And we laugh because it rings as sort of true, right? And yet that's kind of the impulse, like, oh, nobody's paying attention to this. Let me just get more out there about this thing. Doesn't necessarily spawn more effort. And finally, reporting can be burdensome. This is something that sometimes comes as being part of a governing organization or, or an umbrella organization. Oftentimes, uh, having to chase down the answers to sort of write those reports and follow those reports uh, can consume a great deal of energy that doesn't go into building the software. All right, final area of kind of challenge around interventions where the research record, I think, is a little bit mixed. Uh, is around coordination. So automation is helpful, we hear that again and again, but it can also kind of run up the bills. It can be the first time you have to spend money as a project to keep up with your CICD levels. There can be a lot of waste in that automation. Dependabot may be sort of picking your pocket every month. You need to document your decisions and acceptance criteria as you're coordinating. Just live coordinating as you go may end up biting you. Finally, although this is an element of different communities' culture, some folks say review then commit, some people do commit then review. Turns out review then commit is shown in this data to slow down the pace of sort of change. And if you want to keep your coordination costs low, you probably want to do commit then review. All right, so those are kind of the strategies around response and where intervention is challenging. I have three areas of immediate action, things anyone, everyone in this room can do today. Uh, so data toxicity and valuing one another before we sum up. So one area of immediate action, collecting data and have a plan to use it, always vital. Uh, minimize toxicity and valuing your fellow contributors. Let me unpack each of these. So when we collect data and we have a plan to use it, Keeping logs and records can help a lot, but the historical interpretation and metadata is really needed. Sometimes I go and I dig up data from a source and there's some big drop off or something's happened. Like, oh, what is this? Is that significant? Is it not? No one wrote down that, oh yeah, that's the date when this piece of infrastructure died, or oh yeah, we totally changed how we measured X, Y, Z, and the only person who knows that is Joe. 
And I wish Joe would write it down because Joe has left. You know, it's been 10 years. Uh, if you write to him now, he might tell you that, oh yeah, that was when I totally changed how I measured this subject, you know, this topic, uh, changed our log format or what have you. If you write down that metadata, keep those events alongside your log data, it'll be a lot more valuable for you later. All right, so it's that like, oh yeah, if I sit down and explain, oh, that's where the spike came from. Great, let's write that down. Engaging with metrics communities and researchers, I'm a fan of that one. Um, reaching out, Community Data Science Collective is here in multiple. Uh, this is a coalition of researchers who care about communities in all their many dimensions. Also places to consider are this scarf.sh and the Chaos Project, tons and tons of metrics related resources. If you were here earlier, you got to hear Dawn talk about chaos. Scarf.sh is pretty cool in that they're trying to intervene in this question of getting great metrics about usage sort of early rather than later trying to go back and figure out what's going on. I also want to invite folks to open their communication channels with users to talk about things like quality and security as well as importance, where is something being used, being aware of this. I can do some of these analyses in Debian because they know some of these things about the importance of their packages, but a lot of fo folks just don't keep track of this information. All right, let's talk about toxicity. Toxicity comes up a ton in research as well as at open source conferences. And I will say that toxicity might be the one topic in all of open source research about which there is a research consensus. Like climate change is real, toxicity also real. <laughs> Toxic comments drive people away, they scare off potential newcomers. We know that experienced contributors look for a toxicity and avoid joining because of it. We know that toxic code reviews or ones that are shallow or disengaged, waste people's time, drive people away. However, emphasizing the shared goal of the project can help your retention and joining. We can act against that one. All right, action area three, valuing contributors. Focus code contributors build sustainability. That one pops out of the research rec record right away. Wide ranging non-code contributors build sustainability. So let me ex sort of explain a little bit about the study that brought us those. The notion here is, okay, if folks are contributing to my GitHub project, which of these folks are actually making a big difference in terms of whether that uh, project is sustainable or not? Focus code contributors are those who are not contributing to a ton of other projects all over the place. Instead, they're only working on maybe one or two projects or six projects, but not 50, not 100. Uh, whereas your wide-ranging non-code contributors, what does that mean? Those are folks who, yeah, maybe they're dipping their toes in in tons of little places. Those folks are also helpful with sustainability. They're going to write documents that are reflective of um, how things are used or done in other places. They're bringing in best practices from totally separate communities. So these two folks, these are like gold. People who are not widely involved in tons of other projects. If they want to write code, great. People who are involved in a lot of other projects in a very casual way, also great. Get them writing your docs. Uh, another area around valuing contributors that really pops out of the research record is the way that although technical chops are needed, what people really value is communication. That's what characterizes your great maintainers. Maybe you don't want to make someone a maintainer just because they're great technically. Maybe your second greatest contributor should be the one who's the maintainer or your fifth greatest because that's somebody who can communicate and get out there and manage folks and move things forward. Finally, uh, retaining people in the community also helps fight misalignment, and I have a worked example for what that looks like, building on the previous kind of analysis example that I showed. So keeping people helps keep that match between what's highly important and um, what is good quality. All right, so I worked through this example in the context of Wikipedia. It's an analogous context to free and open source software. It has some advantages in terms of measurement, but I think uh, the findings here are pretty translatable. In that case, uh, sort of step one, pick a quality measure. Uh, in that one, we're using structural completeness of articles. Pick an importance measure. We use readership. Pick a relationship. Same relationship I talked about with software. Uh, we want the most important articles, most widely read articles to also be the best quality. And what we found as we traced this is that as people persist, as they stay in the Wikipedia community, the things that they choose to work on 
are those underproduced articles, those low quality but highly important articles. So I think this translates to software as well. And we see that in um, interview data as well. We talk about long-term contributors. They say, oh yeah, well when, now that I've been here long enough, my goals have changed. I am more committed to the community overall having been here for longer. So we wanna keep that alignment between quality and importance. Retaining folks, keeping folks around is a way to do that. However, everything always seems to come with a caveat. The caveat in this case is that there is a risk of oligarchy forming as you retain people. We have felt this pain as well. So we need to continue to think about how to work against oligarchy, how to keep the process open and new people able to participate in making the rules, uh, even as we try to retain these long-term folks. All right, so once we have that data, I just think it's fun to look at. Uh, once you have data about how things vary in terms of alignment, you can start to trace where your, how your contributors move through time and the trajectory that individuals follow. So if you have a big ecosystem, uh, you can start to follow kind of what individual, the path individuals follow. And Wikipedia lets us do that, which is why this is here. All right, so we've got orientation. We did some challenges. We talked about responding. Let me sum it all up. Building and maintaining free software is a huge endeavor, as we know. Critical components can be neglected. Communities can be hard to sustain. We need to actively align our efforts with public needs and do so sustainably. Formality, extensive reports, incautiously kind of seeking funds and newcomers anywhere we can find them, it really might not help us. However, Gathering great data, sharing power, minimizing toxicity, and encouraging one another, those are things that work. All right, thank you all so much. I would love to hear your questions about free and open source software research. Uh, thanks to our funders. I am always seeking new funding and collaborators to work on these kinds of projects. So if you have ideas, let's talk. Thank you. All right, we have time for questions. Do you have questions? So many slides, yeah. Wrong direction. The one with my name on it? Oh, okay. Oh, cool, yeah, I can do that. That's a good question. Um, I ran a similar kind of like, I'm trying to go back all the way to the silly um, thing, but I, I did p run some of this data just through like a general uh, line fitter, and it was sort of a 10 year cycle. Both the projects and the users within the Python projects, it was kind of a 10 to 15 year cycle. The users were following and the code quality was following. Um, how long does it take them to notice or to? The rise and decline was, it was, was, was kind of on the same 10, 15 year cycle. Um, so a little bit generational in some kind of way. Um, but that's within, within Debian Python data in particular. Um, how long does it take people to notice in general or in a broader context? I'm not sure, but I think that's a really good question. I hope that they notice sooner than perhaps that they do. Like I feel like we have a lot of data that says, um, oh yeah, it took forever for this particular sec security patch to get out there. Like even a security patch that's highly um, problematic, that, that solves something that's a huge problem, can take forever to get distributed. So my bet is that it unfortunately takes users longer than perhaps it should to understand that they're using something that's kind of built on sand. That would be my sense. But I think that that's a great, that's a great question. Like how long before the self-correction is sort of inevitable and we all have to move? Yeah, I think that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is, this is my supervisor, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so there's a lot of research that goes, that's gone into measuring 
questions of toxicity. Um, a lot of times researchers use what's called the perspectives API. It's trained on, um, it's a, like a machine learning algorithm. People use that as a predictor of whether or not certain kinds of language is likely to cause people to leave a community. Um, so that's one of the kind of standard measures that people use. Uh, there's some great work by uh, Laura Dabish's team looking at climate coach, look, called Climate Coach, that looks at those environmental factors. So um, it's true that toxicity can be subjective. However, what a lot of these uh, research studies that I cite show is that it's not just uh, someone reads it and they think that it doesn't, that it isn't kind, but rather that there's a model that says not only do we predict that this is negative language or language that makes people want to leave, we can then see it in the data that they don't come back, uh, that they've submitted a kernel patch and they're responded to in a way that's toxic and they leave and don't come back, and the kernel patch, uh, having been evaluated by a neutral evaluator, is good quality. You know, so it was an unnecessary pushback, uh, an unnecessary hostility or toxicity. Um, it's not just a matter of like, oh, this makes me feel bad, but actually it makes people feel unwelcome or unwanted as if their work is futile, and then they, don't con they sort of don't contribute. So that would be sort of my, the, the data seems to suggest that it's more than just like one person's one person's opinion, but rather um, that it seems to lead to actually experience folks don't want to join, um, et cetera, if that makes sense. The, and the data's really there. If anybody ever like tries to fight you on it, I will give you like 50 URLs, you know? Like, this is, this is why I say like in the academic research record, I feel like the, the damage done by toxicity is like approaching the level of scientific consensus. you sort of measure it six ways from Sunday and it comes out with the same results of different kinds of toxicity, different kinds of consequences, every time it seems to be damaging. Yeah. I was really curious to learn more about the comment about paid contributors contribute differently than volunteers. Yeah. I work a lot on open telemetry, which is getting a lot of recent criticism for being, oh, only vendors contribute. So I was really curious, what are the, right. what are the differences that we've seen? Yeah, so this is, a, this is not a study that I did. It was one done in the Rust ecosystem. And what they looked at here was, you know, what's the difference between somebody who's making a contribution, they're paid versus not. Uh, one of the things that they saw is that someone who's a paid contributor is much more likely to have their sort of very large um, kind of code contribution accepted right away. So being able to really like show up, do a big thing, uh, move the needle, maybe move on, um, something like this. It, that dynamic seems to work a little bit better for those paid contributors than it does for volunteers. So the, the issue is less that, uh, you know, are they wanted or unwanted type of contributions. Instead, it's more like, what does it mean for people who are trying to contribute as volunteers when they're essentially in the same contribution space as people who are paid to be there? Um, my personal take, not grounded in research, is that if people are paid to do work, they should do the work that no one wants to do. You know, if you're paid to like to, to contribute, great, pick up the stuff that the volunteers have never been able to get around to or whose like ability to do that on volunteer time is limited. How about refactoring? You know, how about like all of those long live bugs? How about all of that technical debt? That's an awesome place for companies to invest and move the needle in terms of metrics uh, that clearly the volunteers don't want to do it because they haven't for a very long time. So that would be my suggestion at least, if, if I had my, my way on terms of how those paid contributor dollars are used. Other questions and thoughts? Yeah. So earlier you had mentioned um, that like, uh, when you're trying to attract new users, mm -hmm. that's like a long-term aim of you're trying to find like one or two good contributors out of your number of, your pool of new users, correct? Yeah. Um, so uh, in light of Yeah, so bringing people in who are experienced in open source is what really makes the difference in maintainability, but 
yeah, where you get them from is from newcomers. Um, one program that does really move the needle in, um, in the results that I've seen is the outreachy program. So that's something that has been shown again and again to um, get newcomers who don't just show up one time, but they persist over time and continue to make contributions. And so if we look at what makes outreachy different, one of those things is mentorship. And mentorship shows up in the education data. It shows up in um, projects that graduate successfully from the Apache Incubator Program. Mentorship is a huge, even causal factor there in terms of whether or not projects graduate. So I would say that mentorship makes the difference in terms of those newcomers. Spraying out there, we just need people to show up, will get you people who just show up, but people who stay, need to be mentored to stay, and a structured program is a great way to do that. Does that answer your question? All right. Other questions and thoughts about the wide world of open source research? Wonderful, all right. Thank you for being here. Yeah, oh, okay, yes, sir. So I, have a, I have a question about this. This is Mako, this is my, my advisor, so. <laughs> Uh -huh. You you said that like the the toxicity like is conceptualized by like the first by the people who make effective API as That's language that is that is that causes people to leave a conversation, but the result is that toxic language causes people to want to leave conversations. But that's actually just tautological. Like um, so I, I believe that there are qualities of they train a data set based on what causes people to leave. But what's much more interesting to me is not whether or not you can train a classifier that has that feature in it. But like, what is, what actually constitutes, what are the features yeah. that, that are described about that? And I, I don't think that they can tell us. So that particular API, is, it's, it's true. It's, that's not the only way to measure toxicity. It's just super common one for people to reach for because it's an API that's out there. There's some interesting work. Um, I don't know if it's on this. So I don't think this. Shallowness, disengagedness, but another, um, I don't think I got the site on here, but another, uh, oh yeah, actually it's this one right here. This is done in the, D, the D-Web community and what they're looking at there is, um, they didn't run it through Perspectives API, instead what they looked at is uh, they used a human values index, sort of a different language analyzer, and in particular, they found that discussions that used words like rude or polite or code of conduct, those that if discussions like that cropped up more than one standard deviation in prevalence in your sort of run rate of your community, that a spike in that topic led long-term contributors to leave and newcomers not to join. So that's another sort of form, a, a spike in discussion about rudeness, respect, code of conduct, et cetera, causing people to leave. And this isn't, if you, if you have to talk about it, it's a problem. If you have to bring it up, it's an issue. Well, if you add it and it's properly managed, you probably don't talk about it a lot, but it's totally wrong. And this is within DWeb, which already has kind of a, a sort of set level of um, <coughs> expectations about mutual respect and shared values and so on. So it's already kind of a somewhat kind of curated uh, community in terms of values. But even within kind of the DWeb um, kind of zone, if you then have to have a big fight about code of conduct, that's a, a predictor for departures. All right. Oh, yes, Sophia. Uh, I'm curious if there's been any research on the inverse of this, in terms of like we, if we were to talk project or any all know this, mm -hmm. it's the people stay because they're having a good time and they're performing connections and tracking the same thing. Um, which is kind of the inverse of this. If you're coming and you have a good experience, I'm just kind of curious if there's anyone that's sort of investigated that and been able to demonstrate it when it's like looking at how people are interacting with the spaces. Yeah, so this same DWeb study 
Uh, they also looked at what tended to retain people. Um, and what tended to retain people were discussions uh, that were sort of focused on the goal of the community and kind of what we're all here for and what our values are around um, the way we envision our project being used and the change we want to see in the world from that kind of technology point of view. So, I, so my inner social scientist is saying like that's orientation toward artifact in a way that we're, we're turning our attention toward the thing we're here to do, the code we're here to write, and that that made people more likely to stay. Uh, in the context of DWeb, the thing that they're here to write is not just sort of lines of code, but it's actually a, a change in the world. Um, so that sort of those things are bound together there. But that was the that tended to predict retention. All right. Wonderful. Thank you all for being here.